at a time when we The next morning, sore and hungover, it was as if I was breathing new air. For the first time in years, these woods weren't being threatened. If you really allow yourself to let go in nature, something inside of you tries to fight it for a while. But slowly and surely, it takes you over. You lose track of time, of days. Something in you finds a totally different rhythm. I hadn't felt it in such a long time. It's there waiting for you. Something that agrees with you inside. You sit down and find a place to contemplate. Just to think. All I wanted was just to stay here, to stay at home. To be left alone, just to listen. Be thankful. Then all of a sudden, I saw something that broke my meditative trance. My tree was dying. When I was five years old, walking along the dirt road with my father, I saw a little hemlock sapling about my size. It was growing way too close to the road. I said, Dad, I think that tree is going to get hit by a car. We should move it. It's not going to make it there. So we dug up the sapling and moved it to the front yard. 35 years later, it's 40 feet tall. It's more than outgrown me. And what I noticed that day, it was dying, not of natural causes. Half of the tree was gone, being eaten by a parasite called the woolly adelgid, which I learned had been advancing up the coast of the US, eating our iconic hemlock forest from Virginia, advancing through Pennsylvania and New York, all the way up to Maine. Climate change is allowing the woolly adelgid to advance north. Not enough frost, not enough cold days. It just doesn't get cold enough to kill off the bugs anymore. Hemlocks are the forest. They're a keystone species, meaning the rest of the forest depends on them. When I saw the tree, thoughts came rushing in. It dawned on me that even though we could beat the fossil fuel industry in our own backyard, we might lose everything we love to climate change. Just a few months later, New York City was about to get the same wake-up call.
tell me but all my wisdom be part of it city was not built to withstand a storm surge like the one resulting from Sandy. The storm surge overwhelmed the coastal areas, depositing yachts in the middle of streets, flooding houses. In Brooklyn's Sheepshead Bay, the Atlantic Ocean had swamped everyone's first floor. With keys to seven or eight houses along his block, the Flatlands Post Commander for the American Legion Mike Rodriguez, who was coordinating demolition and rebuilding. So this was seven feet of water. On some of these homes, you can see the water lines where the water went up. Right. OK. Was this an official evacuation area or not? Uh, truthfully, no. So people stayed here and rode it out. People just couldn't get away quick enough because it, it came in so quickly. Hurricane Sandy was the largest storm ever to hit the east coast of the United States. It hit at high tide at midnight. Dark, cold, furious, and wet. And when it blew the transformer in lower Manhattan, hundreds of thousands lost power. I'm in the second floor. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Breezy Point, a neighborhood of firemen and first responders burned to the ground when Sandy ruptured gas lines. The firemen in that community who had rushed out to help the rest of New York couldn't do anything to stop it. It smells pretty bad, huh? What is that, it's sewage? Tree. Well, it's sewage. In the beginning, you can hear all the gurgling come from the bowls and sinks and everything. So water was actually coming up through the it toilets? coming up through the toilets. It's amazing to see sand, like, on top of the toilet seat. Yeah. Mike Rodriguez was one of tens of thousands of people all across the coast sorting through everything they had for the few odd possessions that had survived the floodwaters. This is the uh, trap door to the basement. So the water actually, whoa! Pushed it right up. What's the refrigerator doing there? Yeah. I haven't moved the refrigerator yet because I'm still waiting for the people to come and see it because I got a warranty still on it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's warrantied for getting thrown across the room like that. Today it's a year old. That's what the candles are for. It's birthday. <laughs> One of the only things in Mike's flooded house that somehow managed to escape unscathed was his Santa Claus costume. If you look over here where the water line is, and then you look at the buttons on the Santa suit. It, it, it's dry. I mean, there's the hat, the, the, uh... See, there's the wig and everything. The wig and everything. Totally... It, it looked like it wasn't even touched. I just bought that because I need a new Santa suit to play Santa Claus. I do it every year at, uh, St. Finbar's. Okay, for the kids with autism. So, uh, I said, this is one of those little miracles. Just after I left Mike's house, I learned that on their block, water had rushed in so fast that it drowned a woman in her living room. Oh, the man that I was trying to have you film right there, John, camera here, that his wife drowned in that building, in that house. Just now? During the storm. His wife drowned during the storm. As a journalist, you always have that decision to make. That day, I just didn't have the heart to walk up to a man grieving over his drowned wife and say, can I get your story on camera? But the image stuck in my mind, the freezing near November waters of the Atlantic Ocean rushing in, overtaking your front door, your windows, your furniture, and finally you. So this is not a, a normal landfill? No, this is a parking lot. This is a beach, and this is the parking lot for the beach. This is what the remains of a pocket of civilization looks like. Mattresses, sides of houses, 
each small pile representing a person or a family. A tiny sliver of the American dream left on the scrap heap. And huge disarrayed heaps, with every second more and more piled on. And down at the end of the ruined beach house, a tangle of lifeguard chairs that couldn't save a beach from drowning. Everyone in this neighborhood told me I had to check in at the Action Center, a place that existed to address the other disaster that was happening in New York City, economic inequality and poverty. Even a month after the storm, lines for aid at the Action Center went around the block. And the calm at the center of both of these storms was Mrs. Aria Doe. We knew if we weren't here, nobody else was coming. In this community, 65% live 200% below poverty levels. So you have the inherent disease, you have the inherent drugs, you have the inherent crime that comes with poverty and living in a third world situation in an affluent country. So we knew nobody was coming, it's typical. We have clothing, warm blankets. Over here we have food packs. We must have given out eight or 900 today, I would assume. The response has been so overwhelming. There were Brooklyn moms who heard about the babies in wet diapers two weeks later in wet beds. Frontline soldiers that are standing in the gaps between the have and have nots, between the resource and services, and linking them up. We live in, in the United States, and our citizens should not be lacking like this. OK, they supplied us with some water or food or clothing. But right now, besides that, we need love. We need counseling. We need help unconditional. And it's sad that we have to meet like this. I mean, you can see the sand from the beach right here. Right, look at the sand right there. But this is now beachfront property right here. Right, exactly. You go, you can, nice. You can charge more. <laughs> and this right here, what you looking at? This is part of the sand dune that was sitting on the beach for the birds, right. but now it's in the park. Isn't Look what Sandy opened did. Up. Yeah. Sandy had rearranged the elements of a boardwalk into a cubist abstraction of what a boardwalk would be. Picasso would have been proud. So if you had a message to take to people from here, what would it be? An old saying like Spike Lee, Wake up. That was it for me. That was the moment I realized I couldn't go back home to escape into the woods.
You know, I met a very interesting guy. His name was Bill. He said we need to stop calling it Sandy. Right. We need to call it Exxon and all the other gas companies that's causing this ruckus right here. Yeah, I know that guy, Bill. I got to thinking how unfair it is to sort of name these things after harmless girls. You know, every girl named Sandy in the New York metropolitan area is going to spend the next 10 years hearing bad jokes. Time to name them for the people who are causing them. We should go right through the alphabet, finding every oil and coal and gas company, because this it's these guys' carbon pouring into the atmosphere that are supercharging these hurricanes. Sandy was the lowest barometric pressure ever recorded north of Cape Hatteras. Its wind stretched further than any storm we've ever measured. We should call it what it is, Hurricane Exxon. And that way, the stories in the paper and on the news would sound just right. Exxon is coming ashore along the Jersey coast, destroying houses left and right. Exxon has smashed into lower Manhattan, flooding the subway system. That's how we should be thinking about these things. I caught up with Bill at the most well-lit food court in the capital. Here's how to understand the basics. When you burn coal and gas and oil, you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and its molecular structure traps heat that would otherwise radiate back out to space. We've raised the temperature of the Earth one degree so far. That doesn't sound like so much. 20 years ago, we didn't think it would be enough to really alter things, but we underestimated how finely balanced the planet's physical systems were. One degree has been plenty to get everything frozen on Earth to start melting. It's been enough to completely alter the way that water moves around this planet. The atmosphere is now about 4% wetter than it was 30, 40 years ago. That is an enormous change in the basic physical parameter of the planet. Once you've evaporated all that water up into the atmosphere, it's going to come down. And now it comes down in wet areas in deluge and downpour and flood. That's probably the single biggest way you can tell that we've left behind the Holocene, this 10,000 year period of benign climatic stability that underwrote the rise of human civilization. And now we're, you know, running into something else. This is a different planet. We've made it a different planet and we're doing it really fast and it's really dangerous. It's terrible. Cut the cameras. Cut the cameras. Why not? Why not? Why not? Food court closed. It looks like it's open. It's all the life. We just walked right down without any. Anything else? Is it? My orders. Okay. This is well, we're, we're so where would you like us to go? What? It's free country. I mean. No, no, but like down, out of the food court. It's a free country, except in the food court. Except in the food court. The food court. <laughs> Building. I spent a lot of time around the world including in places like the Antarctic, in Tibet, on the great lava fields of Iceland, in the places that remind you that we actually live on a planet. I guess I have a stronger sense than I used to of the fragility of the whole operation. amounts of water are stored in glaciers and the warming of the earth is fundamentally changing the way water moves and behaves around the planet these tiny little rivulets tiny little streams the ice melting running through cracks making their way down to the edge of the glacier i guess every tidal wave starts with one drop you can almost feel a tide building Because of weather patterns and patterns of pollution, the poles are actually warming faster. And although the global average temperature has been raised by one degree Celsius, Alaska's temperature has increased by more than three degrees in the last half century. Glaciers are melting at staggering rates, some of them losing up to one kilometer in thickness. Iceland, Greenland, Antarctica, Alaska. The poles of the Earth warming faster 
than they have in 10,000 years. The Arctic ice cap has shrunk to the lowest level ever recorded. And scientists monitoring the meltdown say acceleration could be catastrophic in terms of sea level rise. And if it doesn't stop, the potential to wreak havoc across the planet starts here, at the top, where the ice is. You wonder, how fast is this happening? How much time do we have left? In Copenhagen in 2009, the world was supposed to come together and solve the problem at the International Climate Conference called COP, the Conference of the Parties. But that's not what happened. Talks devolved, nations fought, no one could decide what to do. The one thing that they did decide was that we were gonna try as a world to keep climate change to two degrees Celsius, but there was no binding agreement about curtailing emissions. Then I learned something startling. The carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere now will continue to warm the Earth for the next several decades, no matter what we do. We've already warmed the climate by about a degree Celsius. We probably have another half a degree Celsius in the pipeline already. We've put enough heat into the oceans, we've put enough greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and if you add that up, that's a half a degree that's committed plus one degree that's already happened, that's one and a half degrees Celsius out of two degrees. At two degrees warming, sea level will rise between five and nine meters. Most of the world's populations, most of the world's cities are on coastlines. Here's what New York City looks like at seven meters of global sea level rise. We lose the harbor in San Francisco and the Central Valley becomes an inland sea. Here's Boston. Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. Here's Florida, Shanghai. The list goes on and on. An Earth that warms by two degrees would force everyone who lives on coastlines to move. Where are all those people going to go? As environmentalists, we've been talking for decades now about saving the planet. But as I think about it, the planet's probably going to be around for some time. What, what's at stake now is, is civilization itself. I don't think civilization can survive the melting of the Greenland ice sheet and the associated rise in sea level. I mean, we'd be looking at hundreds of millions of rising sea refugees. The east coast of the United States would be very vulnerable to even a three-foot rise in sea level. But it's not just the initial rise itself, but the realization that if that happens, that's only the beginning. Greenland and West Antarctica together, it's about 39 feet. So we'd have a world where the land base would be shrinking and the population presumably still growing and enormous stresses on systems as millions of rising sea refugees cross national boundaries creates unimaginable stresses. Big polluters are already putting your bodies on the line. You have a bunch of moneyed interests who have a big monetary stake in the status quo. They don't care the status quo is an airplane pointed straight down and accelerating. It's, it's their airplane, and they don't want anybody to bail out of it. The big polluters who are selling you carbon-based fuel only want one thing, everything. I also learned that two degrees is not just a limit, it's an average. It's an average, right? But it combines the temperature data we have from thousands of stations for a year. Desmond Tutu said, for Africa, a two degree target means three degrees warming, 3.5, four degrees warming. And he says, if you agree to two degrees, you agree to cooking our continent. In daily temperatures of 45, 48 degrees Celsius, agricultural life in a rural community would cease. My worst fear is that we've seen the veritable tip of the iceberg. The unprecedented drought we're seeing in California is likely symptomatic of far worse drought over an exceedingly larger part of the world. We are seeing more intense hurricanes driven by warmer ocean temperatures. 
Superstorm Sandy is a harbinger of what's to come. We'd be looking at increased extreme weather, like the swarms of tornadoes that hit the Midwest in 2011, or the polar vortex, the circle of Arctic air that spun out of control in 2014 and 2015, creating record snowfalls in Boston and New York. And these were not the only effects that were happening right now. Coral reefs experienced the worst bleaching incident in history, one step on the way to death. The cause, a warming ocean. We're literally seeing the loss of habitats, the migration of habitats, at a rate that these species just can't keep up with. Species are moving towards the poles, or if they live on mountainsides, they're moving up the mountains to try to stay in the envelopes of their thermal tolerance. If you look at endangerment rates, how many mammals are considered endangered, it's, it's about a quarter. And if you look at the rate in a which... A quarter of all mammals are considered endangered yes, right now. Yes, yes. And that Australia has invented new colors for their weather map because it's never been that hot before. Lots of projections on crops. We can only imagine food insecurity skyrocketing. The failure of the Russian grain harvest or the failure of the Texas winter wheat harvest or the worst flooding in history in Pakistan, Australia, Texas, Vermont, Turkey or the worst droughts in history in the Middle East. Syria experienced its worst drought ever. Five years of no rain. And when farmers protested the uneven distribution of aid, the authoritarian Assad regime put many of them in prison, setting off the Syrian civil war, the world's first climate change civil war. And now Syrians and Mideast refugees swarming across European boundaries. Four-star generals are telling us that climate change is our greatest potential national security threat. And I learned that in 2011, the U.S. House of Representatives voted 240 to 184, defeating a resolution that simply said, climate change is occurring, is caused largely by human activities, and poses significant risks for public health and welfare. That's it, just an acknowledgement of the science. And that the fossil fuel giants, the Koch brothers, plan to spend nearly $1 billion in the 2016 presidential election. Maybe that's why every single Republican candidate denies the fossil fuel connection to climate change. And all of this is happening in plain sight. There are thousands of climate scientists and climate analysts and political analysts who know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. But even today, science and politics are at odds. In Paris at COP21 in 2015, 200 nations came together and signed an unprecedented climate deal. But the emissions targets set in Paris are nowhere near enough. They still set the world on track to warm by 3.5 degrees, prompting some scientists and analysts to say that Paris was actually a step backwards from the two degree target set in Copenhagen, especially dire considering that Lester Brown said, if we want to save the Greenland ice sheet, then you're looking at an 80% cut by 2020. 2020 to stave off the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. How are we going to reduce emissions by 80% when what's actually happening is that we are increasing emissions and the fossil fuel industry right now is expanding with hundreds of gas-fired power plants and thousands of miles of frack gas pipelines proposed and an expansion of offshore drilling in the United States. Power plants all over the world being built every day that would be burning fossil fuels well into the 2050s. And in fact, a 2015 study from the University of Florida tells us that based on current CO2 levels in the atmosphere, we're in for a five to nine meter sea level rise no matter what. Overwhelmed, overwhelmed, overwhelmed. And projections indicate... We don't stop at two degrees. We sail right past it on our way to three, four, five degrees Celsius. It is often said we are running a global experiment for which we have no control. 70,000 people died in Europe because of the heat wave under a 0 0.8 degree warming. And we will hit two degrees of warming by 2036. Yeah. I mean, how do... And that many analysts say the window to keeping us at two degrees in terms of curtailing emissions closes in 2017, overwhelmed, overwhelmed. And it wasn't just fossil fuel emissions. And that's where things get really tricky. 20 to 35% of climate change causing emissions were coming from the food sector. Methane's even more potent, a heat absorber, than we thought before. Americans eat nine ounces of meat per person per day. That's unprecedented in human history. In other words, a major overhaul of every human system politics, food, 
energy, transportation, media, and all in the next three to four years. I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to watch a few cat videos right now. <laughs> and you have ocean acidification. The same CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere is seeping into the oceans and acidifying them and literally dissolving creatures like shellfish that make calcium carbonate skeletons. The oceans are, are now 30% more acidic than they were at the start of the Industrial Revolution. If you talk to marine scientists, the ramifications are potentially, you know, the list is almost endless. At two degrees warming, 30 to 50% of all the species on the planet would go extinct, overwhelmed, can't think. And that right now, the forecast for the forests of the American West, in the Grand Teton, in Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, Utah, Montana, that we were watching these ecosystems collapse under the weight of climate change. Different invasive species of beetles were overwintering. The American West didn't have that stretch of cold weather anymore and that the beetles had chomped 83 million acres, and it was supplying an enormous amount of fuel for the worst wildfires raging in American history that had never been that hot and never been that dry. Sometimes when I talk uh, about climate change, when I give a public lecture, I will show the uh, four horsemen of the apocalypse to the audience. And the reason I do that is that each of the horsemen make an appearance in the impact of climate change. War because of increased competition for diminishing resources, famine, especially in tropical regions. Then you have human health, the increased uh, spread of uh, tropical diseases uh, into higher latitude regions, the absence of a, of a killing frost um, will allow uh, many tropical diseases like malaria, dengue, uh, fever to... That's when I realized I was beginning to think it was too late. Too late for the coastlines. Too late for New York City. Just too late. So, yeah, whether it's... Which horseman is that? Pestilence? Uh, that's that's, that's uh, 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 pestilence and, 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 and death. Pestilence and death, yeah. I just felt like giving up. In a cloud. Walking away. Burying my head in the snow that was falling all around me. It was just too much. I felt like letting it all just float away. Now I am falling. Quitting this mission. Becoming just another dot on the landscape. Insignificant. Unable to do anything. Look up and you'll see me. Just let it all go. You know you can hear me. All those greenhouse gases hanging there like a century of human regret. Keep falling I'll find you I would love for this to be the part of the movie where I say everything's going to be okay We're over I can't do that Here's what we know The fires, the droughts, the floods, the hurricanes, the tornadoes They'll get worse We'll lose our coastal cities most of our forests will lose 30 to 50 percent of the species on the planet. Keep That's a lot of goodbyes. How do you even begin to grieve? I felt like I'd eaten from the tree of knowledge 
and there was no going back. But somehow your mind forms a question. Those are all the things that climate change will destroy. What are the things that climate change can't destroy? What are those parts of us that are so deep that no storm can take them away? I am scared. find the people who'd found this place, this place of despair, and who'd gotten back up. I needed to find the people who had no choice. Waiting for snow drift. What are the things that climate change can't destroy? My the moment you surrender, I really think that's the moment when you change. But that's also the moment you find the revolution inside. My fleeting soul. into the jungle. <laughs> this is like paddling through a cornfield. You know, it's like the Amazon is made of salad. It's like a salad. <gasps> look at that tiny little frog. Oh my God. And look at that spider. Oh my God, look at the size of that tree. Wow. Look at that tree. Is that a tree? What the fuck is that? Yes, this is the egg of the churro. The egg of the churro. The churro. Eggs of the churro. Uh-huh. That's it. What's a churro? Yeah. <laughs> what is that sound? Tree is so weird. It landed right there. Look at that. Oh, wow. That's a huge cricket. That's the biggest cricket I've ever seen in my life. Fighting wasps that don't let go. Oh. Monkeys? Where? It's jungle rat on your back. Hmm. Not, a, not anymore. <laughs> not, not anymore. OK, well, as long as it's gone now. The Amazon River is the longest river in the entire world, running more than 4,000 miles. But the Amazon is not just a river. It's a whole ecosystem. The Amazon rainforest regulates the climate. It's the lungs of the world. It's the most biodiverse place on the face of the earth. Thousands of species of trees that are not found anywhere else. Animals, insects, everything imaginable. It's raw creation. We think of the Amazon as the purest place on earth, but at the headwaters in Peru and Ecuador, are hundreds of thousands of acres parceled out for oil drilling. With 40-year-old pipelines, spills happen all the time. Latin America is also the most dangerous place in the world to be an environmentalist, with hundreds of human rights and environmental defenders being murdered in the last several years. In spite of the danger, these indigenous environmental monitors were desperate to get the word out. We were investigating two routine spills, not major headline events, things that happen all the time, but devastating nonetheless. We were told that it was 11 kilometer trek into the jungle just to find the spill. We got up at four in the morning, get in canoes, paddle by hand across the Marañón. Bueno, estamos en un lago que pertenece a la comunidad de San Pedro, el lago llamado Carachamal. Nos vamos con dirección al oleoducto y luego por el oleoducto a donde se dio la ruptura del oleoducto norperuano donde se derramó el petróleo crudo. You seem to know every single little stream and little place to go in. Like, have you just discovered this as a child? Does he have a map of it in his head? How does it work? Ah, bueno, este, es nuestro territorio, ¿no? Es igual, por ejemplo, que los que viven en las grandes ciudades, ellos conocen sus ciudades, ¿no? Muy bien y no se pierden. 
y nosotros también como pueblos indígenas es nuestro territorio y conocemos perfectamente porque es de nosotros, ¿no? No hay necesidad que tengamos una brújula, no hay necesidad que tengamos un GPS, porque eso es nuestra costumbre de nosotros como pueblos indígenas, es nuestro espacio, no es nuestro mundo, donde nacemos, donde crecemos y en esta selva eh, donde encontramos donde encontramos lo que se compra en las ferreterías, es nuestro mercado, es nuestra escuela. Ander and his team of indigenous environmental monitors work for free. They were offered to be paid by the government, but said no because they didn't want the potential influence and corruption that could come of it. They were there to protect their church, their cathedral, their high school, their hardware store, their source of food. Desde que inició la extracción de petróleo en nuestro territorio, en el territorio del pueblo Cucama y de otros pueblos indígenas como del Pastaza, Corriente, Tigre y Marañón, son exactamente 43 años, ¿no? Que las empresas y el Estado han dado concesiones en nuestros territorios y también en otros territorios de otros hermanos de pueblos indígenas. Bueno, siempre diciendo que el petróleo es desarrollo. Con el petróleo el Perú y ustedes se van a desarrollar, van a mejorar la calidad de vida. O sea, el Estado viene y nos impone los conocimientos del mundo occidental y dejando de nosotros, por un lado, nuestras costumbres, como nosotros sabemos utilizar las plantas medicinales ¿no? y, y nuestra lengua. Entonces nosotros decimos, ¿dónde está el desarrollo que el Estado nos ha dicho? Cuando nuestras condiciones para nosotros ya es peor, porque antes que ingresen las petroleras, nuestros antepasados, nuestros abuelos, comían peces sanos, no estaban con el riesgo que se van a enfermar. Y ahora ya comemos nuestros peces, empieza a, a enfermarnos. Y entonces nosotros lo entendemos y para nosotros que el petróleo significa muerte, destrucción de la Amazonía y el aplastamiento de nuestros derechos como pueblos indígenas. Going with these guys in hand carved canoes with hand carved paddles four or five kilometers deep into the jungle just to hit the trailhead, paddling through this mystery, silently, quietly. It's the stuff that happens to you in your dreams. Watch the guy at age 65, after paddling six hours, pulling his canoe through the brush in two feet of water. These guys do this every day, spill after spill, and they never seem to get tired. That's how badly they want the story out. So we got to the trailhead after paddling five or six hours through this amazing sunken forest. After another hour or two of wading through this soaked underwater trail, we finally emerged at high ground. We were getting close, we saw this ominous sign, a worker's latex uniform on a cross, ghostly and ghastly. And then of course, as we got nearer to the spill, the smell of petroleum. Bueno, en esta zona todo se ve petróleo crudo. Estamos viendo ahora aproximadamente, se están llegando ya cerca de sus dos kilómetros, ¿no? Que sigue avanzando y si sigue Petroperú trabajando de esta manera, no, se, no avanza más, va a seguir avanzando más el crudo. Y ahora los, nuestros, los perjudicados son nuestros hermanos que están en la comunidad de San Pedro, porque todo este agua sale por la quebrada y sus lagos de ellos, por, por el lago por donde que hemos pasado, ¿no? Son lagos muy grandes y esos peces ya están contaminados, porque ya de, desde luego las, las personas pescan comen y ya les hace mal, les, les da diarrea, vómito, dolor de estómago, ¿no? Como se está viendo, los hermanos están trabajando, no tienen protección, se les ve manchado en su ropa el petróleo crudo, ¿no? Y se les ve, y acá ellos debían de tener una protección porque el contacto directo, entendemos que el contacto directo con la piel, el petróleo crudo es malo, pero sin embargo ellos se les ve con una ropa llena de petróleo crudo. These guys were trying to pick up thousands of gallons of oil with buckets and rubber gloves, day after day, inhaling the volatile organic compounds, getting sick, and then a new group of workers would come in, doing this in Wellingtons and jeans. That the company cared that little about giving its workers safety equipment, you can imagine how little they cared about destroying the rainforest itself. 
that a 40-year-old pipeline is going to rupture and going to spill is a foregone conclusion. At that point, you can't even really call it a spill. A spill is something that happens by accident. You're reaching for the corn and you knock your glass of milk off over the table. There's a big difference between accidents and negligence. Besides oil drilling, another huge threat to the Amazon is deforestation. Companies will come in, buy parcels of land, say that they're going to do something relatively innocuous, and then clear cut the hell out of the forest. Again, we had to come in the back way. Desde aquí no hay muy lejos. Era unos 15 minutos, eh? 15 a 10 minutos más aproximado. Under the canopy of trees, it's cool. The sun doesn't break through, except in small spots. One more time, bushwhacking through the most biodiverse forest on the face of the earth. A kind of beauty that you can't possibly describe. Este es un camino que caminaba la gente, se iban a sacar sus hojas para sus casas. Y, pero... También se iban a cazar sus animales para que coman, ¿no? Porque se alimentan sus añujos, majás, eh, carachupa, venado, sajino, guangana. Pero de aquí a unos par de minutos vamos a llegar a la zona de forestada, que ya no hay los animales, ya no se les ve a los animales. ¿sí? Han destruido nuestras maderas, nuestras plantas medicinales, nuestras hojas, madera por nuestras casas. Todo han destruido la empresa. He said it was a 15-minute walk to the edge of the forest. Of course, an hour and a half later, we got there and sent up the drone. beginning to be a habit of mine to go to some of the most beautiful places on earth, be completely awestruck in their majesty, and then arrive at the location where they're currently being destroyed. Only millennia after millennia could develop this type of richness. And then you arrive at what man is doing, this culture, which is inevitably to destroy that incredible intoxicating beauty. Oh, dejamos que nos invade. Pues la empresa va a ser dueño, va a apropiarse de nuestros terrenos si nosotros no no reclamamos nuestro derecho. Porque ellos tienen suficiente dinero que a las autoridades le le compran la conciencia. Pero nosotros no somos humildes, humildes campesinos que vivimos labrando la tierra para nosotros alimentar de eso. Deforestation accelerates climate change because forests breathe in and contain the carbon that we exhale through our bodies, through our factories, through our cars, and through our industrial processes. The technical term for it is a carbon sink. I think about it as it's the body of the forest. Carbon makes up the trees. It's a synchronicity and balance that the planet Earth achieved. People and animals exhale carbon dioxide. Trees inhale carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen. When you cut down the forest, you get less oxygen and you get more carbon dioxide. Protecting the Amazon from deforestation and oil drilling has got to be at the top of any climate list. I can't, I can't believe how much, like, poem is good. Like, it's a, really amazing. The 
Sarayaku River reminded me so much of the Delaware, an old, winding, brown river that really wasn't all that deep. And just like on the Delaware, the tribes on the Sarayaku had defeated the oil and gas industry. A representative of the next generation in Sarayaku, Nina Walinga, was becoming internationally recognized as a voice on climate. Sometimes I come here in the night and I lay down and the sky is like just full, full, full of stars. This is the town that fought the oil industry and won. Yeah, this is it. I might have been like seven or eight years old, something like that. And they came here to negotiate with our leaders. But especially the women, that they said no. When we said no, they backed up the oil companies with the military forces. Wow. And I think that when the government sent the military troops here, they thought like, OK, so Sarayaku, middle of nowhere, nobody knows who they are. Right. They're just like around 1,000 people, and nobody w will care. Right. But <laughs> I mean, we were smarter than that. Right. My uncle had this video camera, and he taped what was going on, and suddenly everybody knew about what was going on here. Yeah. Can you imagine running up to a military helicopter and confronting them and saying, what are you doing here? We don't want you here. But that was the strength of the movement in Sarayaku. Yo he sido la persona que Sarayaku ha designado para documentar todas las historias, toda la lucha, todos los testimonios, la resistencia, el mensaje que Sarayaku quiere enviar a los pueblos que están en las ciudades. Porque sabía de su importancia para la lucha de los pueblos indígenas. Entonces tomé mi cámara y fui a documentar lo que estaba pasando. Is that an umbrella? That's for your camera. <laughs> Great. There you go. Sarayaku is hundreds of miles into the jungle. And they have a documentary edit bay with an internet hookup run by solar panels. Impressive. Muy buenos días, señores periodistas. Vamos a plantear todo el tema del consentimiento libre, previo e informado, y que nosotros tengamos el poder de decir no. No cogimos las armas para defendernos, sino usamos los medios de comunicación, mecanismos jurídicos. Por eso logramos llegar a la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y logramos ganar un juicio al Estado ecuatoriano. Esto es, esto es importante para nosotros porque las luchas deben ser creativas, ¿no? luchar con la música, luchar con la cultura, eh, luchar con la danza. Hemos venido desde lejanas tierras de Sarayacu, del río de maíz. Nosotros somos descendientes del jaguar, hijos de Amazán Garuna, hijos del pueblo del mediodía. No solamente estaba amenazado el territorio natural, sino nuestro territorio espiritual, nuestro territorio cultural, nuestro territorio psicológico, emocional. Si nos dejamos consumir por la ciudad, vamos a ver a la selva como solo un objeto de dinero. Solo el, este árbol es dinero, a este árbol hay que vender, o la madera, o los animales solo como economía, pero nosotros vemos como parte de nosotros, como, como nuestra vida. They had the basic belief that everything alive has a spirit that everything from the yucca plant to the jaguars, to the parrots, to the trees, to the parasites, everything was to be respected. Everything was to be honored. Pero esas petroleras dicen que nosotros somos pobres. Nosotros somos pobres y debemos tener un otro tipo de desarrollo. Debemos tener carros, debemos tener todos los lujos que tienen en la ciudad. 
pero para nosotros el territorio es suficiente. Yo soy un pobre en un, con un territorio de 135 mil hectáreas. Ese territorio me va a producir, puedo cazar, puedo pescar, puedo andar libremente, sin estrés, sin preocupaciones, con una libertad. Nosotros pensamos que somos ricos, tanto a nivel espiritual. The tribes in Sarayaku had actually created a new section of international law, an important legal precedent for indigenous people everywhere. There's a bold tactic, a tradition really, that people have used in desperate times to make a difference. And although he didn't plan on it, Tim De Christopher in Utah felt he had no choice. The Bush administration's Bureau of Land Management rushed to do one last favor for their friends in the oil and gas industry. And they held an auction to sell oil and gas drilling rights on thousands of acres of federal land. Now, sites were located in fragile ecosystems near breathtaking scenery, like a parcel of land near Arches and Canyonlands National Parks in Utah. Many environmental groups launched campaigns to oppose the sale of the land. 27-year-old Tim De Christopher posed as a potential bidder and bid hundreds of thousands of dollars on parcels of the land, driving up prices and winning some 22,000 acres to block the sale by disrupting the auction itself. And although the Obama administration eventually threw out the auction, finding the whole proceedings illegal, they still prosecuted and convicted Tim De Christopher for violating a federal oil and gas law. It wasn't uh, especially premeditated. I got in there and, and saw the opportunity to make the difference and then realized that, that seeing that opportunity, uh, I couldn't ethically justify not taking it. He took us to the parcels of land he defended just weeks before his sentencing. This area is all the parcels that I've won. Wow. You won how many? I won 22. Oh, 22,000 acres. Yeah, 22,000 acres. And these are still now protected. Yeah, I mean, as protected as most federal land is, which is not all that protected. <laughs> the shift occurred for me that it wasn't about environmental issues anymore, but it was about where we're headed and what that really meant in human terms. Um, I mean, so much of it was often discussed in, in rather sterile scientific terms. And not many people were talking about it in terms of the actual human impact, the social impact of what that looked like for our society, what it looked like when there are cities underwater and millions of refugees streaming inland. And getting to that point where if you are going to have enough to eat, it means someone else not having enough to eat. Survival actually meant surviving at someone else's expense. In terms of a solution, clearly there's this idea of renewable energy, but that doesn't take into account any kind of structural approach. Solar, wind, geothermal, those can actually produce enough energy to meet our energy needs. But there's no renewable energy technology, there's no energy source that we've ever discovered that can produce enough energy to produce enough material goods to meet our emotional needs. What I'm trying to say is you can't divorce energy from the rest of the system, from the rest of the model. Energy production is not separate from social issues, from the way that we seek happiness in our culture, from our economic system. It's not an isolated issue from our political system or our corporate structure. When we're looking at those solutions of renewable energy, um, we need to understand that we need more than just a shift in energy. We need a shift in that entire model that's interconnected. Our old model, trying to meet all of our emotional needs with consumer goods, hasn't made us happy anyway. It hasn't worked. There's a lot of ways in which um, a collapse can be a step forward for us of saying, no, oh, maybe greed and competition weren't the best values to be basing our society off of. It can be that opportunity to refocus because in this period of being too late to stop climate change, we're going to be navigating through the most intense period of change that humanity has ever seen. And it means it's a bigger fight than before. I stopped trying to avoid despair. And then I even stopped trying to get through despair. And I just picked it up and carried it with me everywhere that I go. And just realized that I had to make a place in my heart for despair and keep doing the work. One way of looking at it is that carrying around a heavy weight is a burden in tranquil times. 
but in turbulent and stormy times, that heavy weight is an anchor. And that big rock that you carry around can be what prevents you from getting swept away. Just after this interview, Tim was sentenced to two years in federal prison. They took him straight out of the courtroom and locked him up on the day of his sentencing. Didn't even have time to clean up his apartment. Across the world, Australia had basically committed to taking a chunk out of its continent in the form of coal and shipping it out to Asia to be burned in rapidly developing economies of China and Southeast Asia. Once burned, the carbon from these mines flooding the atmosphere threatens to warm oceans, raise sea levels, and flood dozens of low-lying Pacific Island nations. Places like Vanuatu, Samoa, the Solomon Islands, the Marshall Islands, Fiji, Tuvalu. Many of these nations are atolls, islands only a few meters above sea level. An unprecedented gathering of fighters from 12 Pacific Island nations the Pacific Climate Warriors were formed. Can a person stop a wave? Could you stand on the shore and stop a wave from crashing? Can you imagine growing up on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Blue water, fish, sun, beautiful. Some place that a lot of people would think about as a kind of paradise. But then imagine that one day, the waves that used to gently lap at the shoreline started to get more ferocious, creeping up further and further inland till they reach the front of your house, till they sink the whole of your island paradise. Thousands of Pacific Islanders have already had to vacate their home islands due to saltwater intrusion and sea level rise. The Pacific Climate Warriors decided to fight back against Australian coal, blockading the largest coal export facility in the world, the port of Newcastle, where hundreds of thousands of tons of coal are shipped out every single day. The Marshall Islands is barely three meters above sea level, yeah. We're very exposed to climate change, and when the floods come, like, we really don't have anywhere else to go. It's much like Tuvalu, Kiribati, the Maldives. So you're worried that you're going under first? Yeah. With hand-carved traditional canoes, they were set to paddle out into the channel of Newcastle to try to blockade and stop coal ships that were the size of the Empire State Building. Have you... Commanded a boat like this? Yeah, before? I'm the uh, captain of this. Uh, the, the, uh, we call it the Borugu, which is the, the locker. It's amazing, huh? Yeah. How many people can fit in it? Uh, yeah, 10 people can fit inside. But if you, if you have like skinny, skinny people, they can fit like more than 10 people, uh, 15 people to be out there. 10, but more than 10 if they're skinny. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we lost most of the coast areas. We lost most of the coast already. Yeah, yeah. the coastal erosion is just that devastating. It's just really fast. The Pacific Islands have renewable energy. And this will really uh, show a really clear picture and a really clear message to, the, to Australia, which is our neighboring country. We fight for our survival with what is going on here in the, in the gold industry. And how can this government or these people say that it's not real and continue to expand coal industry? You know, that's just selfish. Our values, our cultural values, is one of the reasons why we're in this fight. Everybody is equal, so we care for everybody. And just before I came here and my brother went fishing, because of the value and our principles, he has to bring that fish to the village to be distributed for everybody. So everybody cares for each one. We are the family. We are fighting. We are the Johnny. We are fighting. We are the Johnny. We are fighting. say anything else about this sequence you should probably know that the downside of what we we're about to do was you know um this is the short list 
drowning, arrest, run over by boats, all kinds of sharks, jellyfish, getting punched, sea creatures, drifting away in currents out into the Pacific Ocean, cultural disrespect, big waves, well, you get the idea. I'll just say that this was the closest I've ever been to feeling like I was in that last scene in Star Wars. We didn't know what would happen when a massive coal tanker entered the port to be greeted by seven hand-carved canoes from the Pacific Island nations and by dozens of Australian kayaking protesters flooding the channel. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Tiny canoes, like little X-wing fighters, up against the Death Star. Australian police swarming in jet skis, intentionally trying to capsize boaters. The first confrontation was upon us. A huge coal ship was leaving port. I mean, this is amazing. I, this has actually worked. They've actually stopped the coal ship. I can't really describe the feeling of watching people in hand-carved canoes threaten to be sucked under by giant tugboats pulling these ships out to sea. It was true bravery. This was where the protest tipped out of the symbolic and into something actual. This was the fight. This was how you stop a wave from crashing and destroying your home, pulling your family out to sea. This was how you do it. thing to stare down a coal ship like this. Holy moly. Whoa. This kind of confrontation had never happened before. Of course, the Australian police didn't wait long. Oh, man. They took his canoe in the boat. Unbelievable. Cops are reaching into the boats. It was actually a fight. When they opened up for Westerners to get into the Vanuatu canoe, the people who jumped on board were me, a 92-year-old World War II veteran named Bill, a woman and her dog, and a 15-year-old Aboriginal girl. I should point out at this moment that my camera is not at all waterproof. A flotilla of 50 or 60 Australian kayaks surrounded one of the police boats, while the Vanuatu canoe that I was on was over to the left. We were being held in place by a big black police skiff, the waves rocking us back and forth. All of a sudden, a few kayakers broke off and tried to make a run for it. They got out pretty far, causing the Australian Coast Guard to loop around and create a monster wake, a big wave. When the wave hit us, we tipped side to side. Not a problem, but it caused the police boat to tip as well, coming down on the pontoon side of the Vanuatu canoe. I think everybody on the canoe said, oh, shit, at the same time. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. For a second, I thought, oh, maybe we don't actually need that pontoon. Because we rocked once, and we rocked twice. We rocked a third time, and I realized, no, we're going in the drink. We're going where all those many kinds of sharks are under the water. <laughs> This is the kind of thing that seems to happen in virtual slow motion. So I can't tell you at what point in time I recognized that there was someone who had already been arrested on the police boat yelling my name. But it was somewhere between the last rock and the moment I hit the water that I realized I could probably throw my camera to him 15 feet in the air because that was really the only choice. So I threw it and then went under. Oh, shit. <laughs> When I looked up, I was kind of amazed to realize that not only had the police's captive actually caught the camera, but it was continuing to film as all of us, including the 92-year-old World War II veteran named Bill, were paddling, trying to catch one floating thing or another. You right? Mate, give us a hand and put the friggin' camera down. Okay, come 
The mothership had broken into two pieces, was filling with water, and would have to be towed back onto land by the police while its inhabitants were crying on board. Of course, I didn't see any of this because I had been picked up out of the water by the Greenpeace boat, literally lifted up by my life jacket and pushed on board. This was not our finest hour, weeping over a broken ship, a coal barge with thousands of tons of coal leaving port. Stay calm, Mr. Strong! Stay calm, Mr. Strong! If you're really here with us, I want you to take one of these and put it back in the water! But what was amazing was that within about 15 minutes, Everyone had stopped crying, got out their screw guns and their ropes, repaired the Vanuatu canoe, and put it back on the water. You need to win from within. So that even if the people look like, look at you like you're losing, you're not losing because you are, you already won in your heart, you know? By that, you know, hoping that, that that message or that energy that you give out will change somebody else's heart. Like what we're doing here is a statement, it's a very powerful statement that we say we stand as Pacific Islands in solidarity. coal ships left port that day. A huge victory. Ten coal ships decided not to jump into the fray. 578,000 tons of coal was stopped from leaving port, at least for one day, by the Pacific Climate Warriors, who were not drowning, who were fighting. stare straight at the sun, a pale, thin, yellowish disk that bears no threat to your retina. Layer upon layer of particulate matter and smog shielding my eyes from the brightness. I originally thought we were landing in China on a cloudy day. You know, one of those overcast gray days, like it might rain. But then I was told, no, this isn't weather. This is pollution. This is an okay day. This isn't even a bad day, you're saying. It's just a regular old day. These are nice buildings. It'd be great to be able to see them. So inside, the air is filtered. Oh, wow. Every apartment, every car had an air filter that filtered out something called PM 2.5, particulate matter that was 2.5 microns, small enough to be inhaled, pass through your lungs, and enter your bloodstream. And in Shanghai, Beijing, and many other places throughout China, people would get up, look at the app on their phone, and check the PM 2.5 count. Just like you were checking the weather. In Chongmi, we have 50 today. Mm -hmm. So that's actually very good. 50 is good. What's bad? I mean, in the United States, right. it's probably 10 every day. 10, OK. The pollution all around us. Where did it come from? Burning coal to supply power for factories and construction. Everywhere we went, construction, construction, construction. I've never seen so many cranes in my life. It looked like places they were building entire cities from nothing. And they were. China is building the equivalent of one Philadelphia-sized city every month. And for some reason, the Chinese didn't build individual apartment buildings. They build the same building over and over and over again next to each other. Building complexes of 60 buildings that were all the same. And the same went for trees. Deforested areas in China replanted as monocrop. One tree in rows cloned ad infinitum. And I realized 
Beijing was a city of 20 million people, and none of them opened their windows. Do you do this often? Like, get on top of rooftops? What's the PM now? 241. 241. Okay. It's got a little symbol that says, go. don't fuck with this. People are posting comments. Look here, it's the emotions of people. Emoticon with the people with a mask? Yeah. People are crying. It's really bad. So bad, you can't open windows. Okay, you, you can only use air conditioning. It's just like a circle. It's a, you know, it's a circle. circle yeah. yeah, because the it's more air conditioning you use, the more power you're yeah. using, the more you're burning coal. The more coal is burned, the more you can't open your window. People don't use bicycles, right? People drive cars. Right. I I go to a supermarket. I drive a car, even it's walk distance. You know, I don't want to be outside. Right. In this year. Right. Implications for people's health and children's health were off the charts. Air pollution is killing about 1.6 million people every year in China, or nearly 4,400 people every day. That's 10 747s crashing every single day. Oh my God. Is this for real? No man's land, that's why people bury their dead here, right? One meter next to the power plant. I just can't believe this. Can you imagine coming to visit your loved ones here in this place? Someone's coming here. They're new flowers. You smell that? You smell terrible. Something really awful happens to a person in a place where there is this much bad air. If you can't trust the air you breathe, it alters your internal approach to everything. You don't want to touch things or people. You don't sleep well. You don't feel confident in the words you speak. There's no joy, no enjoyment, no urge to dance, to sing. Joy requires deep breaths. So does laughter. So does singing. There's no freedom possible without a clean environment. That's clear here. Pollution is oppressive in the most basic sense. The air holds you down. So there's part of you perpetually gasping for breath. And the car charges forth to the next interview, to the next location, just past another cooling tower, another smokestack. Windows never rolled down. No breeze ever in a city that never opens its windows. Space That's him? Yeah. I heard about Wu Di, a renegade artist, presenting the pollution problem in China in shocking and innovative ways. Uh, 去新疆去生小孩子现在还没回来又北京的空气而我做这个作品的目的一个是希望它能够影响到中国的一些政府的一些政策这个自从有了工业就开始产生了其实这就是一种消费行为所带来的一个后果这个中国现在一直是世界工
They just happen to be in China. So it's unfair to say, oh, look at Chinese emissions when they're burning all that coal, oil, and gas to make products for Americans and Europeans and people all over the world. This is 2013, She's breathing in the balloon? Yeah. Wu Di became famous overnight for his picture of Fei Fei, a young girl in Beijing with pulmonary problems. Fei Fei's mom, a former aid worker who'd worked in Tanzania, named her Fei Fei, Memories of Africa. Fei Fei was allowed to go out and play when the PM count was under 100. That is, under 10 times what a normal day might be in the United States. We got lucky. The day we went to see Fei Fei, the PM count was 50. What is that? This is the inhaler. That's her inhaler. 2012, we found her some problem. And we went to the hospital. The doctor told me that we have to be extremely cautious when the air is bad. Okay. She is more vulnerable comparing to other, other kids children. because of the throat. Uh -huh. This week you're going to your grandparents? Are you surprised? A lot of mothers talk a lot about the, the air problem here in Beijing, and we are all very careful about this. If you go to the hospital, you see a lot of kids having right. this problem. Right. At first, the Chinese people don't know. I think the government knows, but we don't know. But we can feel it. We can see it, we can smell it. Then we start to ask government. I think this kind of give a very big pressure to the Chinese government because the Chinese people start to ask questions. In China, we, we say every drop of water come together will become a big river or even go become a sea. So I think every Chinese people is like a small drop of water, but we are going to the same direction and we all say that we are not happy with the current situation. China consumes 3.8 billion tons of coal per year. The rest of the world combined consumes 4.3 billion tons. In China, the pollution makes it eminently clear Working on climate change doesn't just mean dealing with the future. It means making the air better right now. It means making public health better right now. It means a whole host of things changing right now. 60% of all of the solar panels in the entire world are made in China. No other country is capable of ramping up production of renewable energy at the scale, efficiency, and cost of China. Solar thermal heating provides hot water to 700 million Chinese. Renewable energy gives us the option to address the system. We think of China as a communist country, but it's not devoid of entrepreneurs like Huan Ming from Haimin Solar. Now this is a formidable temperature application. We need to concentrate the light to a small pipe. So did you design the process? Yeah, you did. How did you get the money to start? There's a market, there's money. Huan Ming, 
CEO made his fortune with an innovation in solar. Hot water heaters that go on the roof of your building. So simple and so affordable. As of 2012, I'm in solar installed units for 250 million people. And that's made Huang Ming a very rich man. My dream was to make solar everywhere, everything. Solar toys, solar chargers, solar heads, solar heating, solar everything. Solar cooker. I love cooking, you know. Chicken? Yeah. Eight minutes. Eight minutes for chicken. Yeah. I get hungry when I'm looking at it. <laughs> Good. Some people collect stamps. Some people collect Star Wars figures. Huang Ming collects antique solar thermal units. He's built an entire museum of the sun. Older machinery. So the museum is not open right now? No. Why? Because it... The museum had been hit by a massive flood. The display panels with words running together like watercolored paintings. What was the flood from, a big storm? Big storm, big rain. I heard that Huang Ming also has one of the solar panels that Jimmy Carter installed on the White House roof. It says, a generation from now, this solar heater can either be a curiosity, a museum piece, an example of the road not taken, or it can be just a small part of one of the greatest and most exciting adventures ever undertaken by the American people. Harnessing the power of the sun to enrich our lives as we move away from our crippling dependence on foreign oil. So it's a museum piece. The solar thermal units went on the roof of the White House in 1979. One of Ronald Reagan's first actions when he became president in 1981 was to take them back down again. A piece of American history rotting in the basement. Do you look at this thing sometimes and feel like there's some kind of magic? Yeah. Right? Yeah, still in good condition. Yeah. Would it still work if you put it in? Yeah. Still works? Yeah. That's America. That's the, that's true America. Right. Not, not the situation right now. Suffice it to say, this is about development. 600 million Chinese people were in the course of migrating from a rural agrarian lifestyle where they maybe use one light bulb in their homes to being modern city dwellers who use a lot of energy. If China's development continues to be dependent on coal, it'll be disastrous for the Chinese and the climate. Through the development of renewable energy, we can work on the bigger problem, the problem that caused all this in the first place, political, social, and economic inequality. Community solar. <laughs> I'm a huge supporter for community solar. We have everything we need. We have all the technologies, we have all the human resources, and we have all the natural resources. Originally from China, Ella Cho is one person who's trying to advise China to go in that direction. An expert in renewable energy, she's advising the Chinese government on community development of solar. Basically, it's a lot of individuals coming together, deciding they need, they want to buy a solar farm that is off-site from where they are living. They can be installed, managed, operated, maintained by a utility even. So I'm looking at these gigantic coal plants. Yeah. And I'm thinking, how is something small like community solar going to compete with this? By scaling. China has the ability to scale up emerging technologies such as CSP, concentrated solar power, right. such as tidal or wave power or any of the hydroconnected power, that will really move the needle on these technologies' own commercialization, make them cheaper for the rest of the world. I'm seeing that we use climate change as an opportunity to harness the power of the people and to be able to develop the technologies in a way that is beneficial for the economy, for the environment, and for all the social benefits that we want to harness out of it. I actually think it's a you know, very precarious balance right now. 
uh, with the economic development, with the increasing inequality, with the environmental degradation. Yeah. In the same day we were with Wu Di, we found a construction hut that was eight RMB per night to rent. No facilities, incredibly dirty, right next to the polluted river. And then we went across town to an $8 million house. So you think inequality is perhaps a greater threat than climate change in China right now? The two are compounded, right? Right. You see the, the poor are really the ones suffering the real consequences of climate change. The challenge is how to build a core value in a way that is free and that it's a people's value. I believe there is something called the moral imagination. The moral imagination? The moral imagination. Uh-huh. So it, I think the moral imagination forces us to get out of our box of thinking about, for instance, what is being successful. Society might tell you that you should work for McKinsey or Goldman Sachs or whatever. You know, as a college graduate, you should go find a job that's your top priority. You should buy a house. The moral imagination allows us to think outside of this box, having a moral value about what you want as a person, as an individual, what you want out of your own humanity. What do you want to do for the world, for yourself? If there was any idea that could rocket you off into the stratosphere, this was it. The moral imagination wrote the Bill of Rights, came up with the idea of democracy. It dreamed up all the core values that were emerging in all these climate warriors around the globe. And all across the earth, a movement was being imagined. The moral imagination designed and built the first solar panels, wind turbines, geothermal power plants, technology paired with an ethical will, innovations in renewable energy, tidal power and wave power installed in seawalls that ring our coastlines, the basic truth that renewable energy can provide 100% of the power on the planet. And right now, people coming up with carbon negative forms of energy that actually take CO2 out of the air, microgrids, permaculture and high yield sustainable farming and nutrition, composting to create a carbon absorbing layer of topsoil, communities banded together to boycott fossil fuel, and a movement of moral investing that had amassed over a trillion dollars in divestment from fossil fuels. There's no end to human innovation once the moral imagination is invoked. And standing there, listening to Ella Cho talk about demand electricity and grid optimization. So these are viable technical solutions to a, a humanitarian problem. I not only felt totally out of my league, but ashamed that I ever wanted to sit at home and do nothing. I wanted to stay home and like hang out in my house and not be bothered. so stupid to think that way, in a way, you know? It's just not possible, isn't it? What's required is so much more. We drove out to Inner Mongolia to see the wind farms, but instead, we got a lesson in human rights. They told us we'd see wind turbines as far as the eye could see. We were giddy. We had the best meal of our lives. We took in a crazy, disney Mongolian horse show. And when we got to the hotel, the rude awakening, the war in Iraq was on the TV. Three Americans stood in the lobby staring at the violent explosions that our country was causing half the world away. And that's the moment that the hotel concierge called the cops. Up until this point, we've been incredibly lucky. We'd escaped the infamous Chinese political repression of journalism and reporting. This was still the China where human rights and democracy were slaughtered in the streets of Beijing in Tiananmen Square in 1989. We realized that all of our footage was vulnerable. None of the copies we'd sent back to the US had left port in China. If the authorities wanted to, they could have taken everything in this segment on China. 
So when Alex, my cameraman, came to my door and told me our producer was being detained, I said, where are the hard drives? He said, I'm hiding them. It's really hard to hide anything in a hotel room. It's either yours or it's the hotel's. And if it's yours, the authorities can just take it. So I did my best to hide the hard drives the only place I could. At 4.30 in the morning, there was a guard outside the door. I've never felt like that in my life. I've never felt what it was like to have all of your freedom of expression, all of my work, at any minute that could be taken away, and there was no guarantee it would ever come back. You're in the nicest hotel room and turn into a prison. But if the foreign affairs police ran my passport, they would see everywhere in the country that we had gone, who we had talked to, the jig would have been up. We would likely have been arrested and deported. And who knows what would have happened to all of this work then. So the next day we woke up after about an hour of sleep, all of our interviews canceled. Somehow everybody heard we had nothing left to do. We decided to just pretend that we were tourists. So the rest of our Mongolian adventure we did with our phones and with a rickety old tape camera which garbled and mangled our footage in a haze of digital static. Everywhere we went, we were tailed. A small white car. We couldn't shake them. We even drove 100 kilometers just to see if they would follow us. They did. And when we got to lunch at a roadside truck stop, there was a guy at the next table glaring at us. I said to our fixer producer, what is that guy doing? He said, he's trying to intimidate you. Why don't you play the banjo? So in the middle of the restaurant, I took out the banjo and started to play. And what was so crazy is that the whole time I was playing, I knew the hard drives, the footage which would have incriminated us, was all inside the banjo as I played. Banjo playing always calms me down. It's my fail safe against all the stress. And this time, I was playing as if all my work depended on it. People in the restaurant started to get into it. And when they applauded, the goon who was staring at us at the table behind me got up and walked away. Banjo one, goon zero. I could see then that hanging over every interview that we had in China, the political repression was as oppressive or more than the air itself. That human rights is the air that you breathe. That democracy is the environment that you live in. And that if you can't do what you need to do with transparency, openness, and freedom, then something fundamental is missing. So this was the lesson in virtue offered to us by these brave Chinese. Speak out in spite of the potential consequences. Luckily, we got through customs without questions. Just take a moment here to look out the window with me. I've always found it unsettling that the minute you step onto a plane, you're reborn. But this time, it was a relief. We landed in a place that was quite literally giving birth to itself every day. The island of Tana not only has the world's most active volcano, Coming this way. But has a thousand-year-old tradition of indigenous democracy. When you want to see a government that is open, transparent, and accountable, this is it. This is it. This is as open as it gets. Under every tree in this tiny island nation, there was a conversation going on about climate change. Because just three months earlier, they'd been hit by the largest cyclone in the history of the Pacific. My friends that had picked up their canoe that broke in half and put it back together were now picking up the pieces of their entire island nation. It was the Hurricane Sandy of the Pacific. Hundred-year-old banyan trees knocked over like twigs. Vanuatu found itself at the center of an international conversation on climate change. The island of Tana is made up of hundreds of small villages, each one governed by their own tribe, each tribe contributing to the conversation, pulling on hundreds of years of traditional knowledge. 
the global action for climate change has to start with people taking responsibility, wherever they are. I respect you, so I will do something to make sure you and I, uh, you know, benefit. These conversations happened in a place called the Naka Mall. The Naka Mall is about a football field-sized area in the center of each town. It's the place where the whole town gathers virtually every day just to talk things through. And at the front of each Naka Mall is a massive banyan tree. This island has huge banyan trees everywhere you look. This is your village. Yeah, this is my village. Wow. So what's really amazing to me is this is not just an, a democratic space. This is a nature space because You've got the tree. Well, the tree is quite important. It's a, it's a structure, a symbolic structure of the council that meets here. You, you can you just, uh, sit on the mat while we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little. Paul's project was to integrate climate science with traditional democratic knowledge. One man stands up, he says, hey, I want to tell you the story of the boy who wanted a bow and arrow from his father. The father gave the bow to the boy. The boy shot a small bird with it and brought it to his father. His father knew that the boy would continue to get bigger and bigger birds. The story ended there. So Paul leans over to me and he says, this is a story about starting small and getting bigger, the way of all progress. He's just talking about the project that we're working on. Ah, I see. Yes. As the this pilot is, project. Yeah, it's the first project which I'm doing. So another man gets up and tells a different story. There's thousands of these custom stories that they can invoke at any given moment. Each one is a teaching story. We do this to influence the course of events. So the Nakamal is not just a town square. It's a place of debate a place of decision-making, a place of democracy. And then all of a sudden, people flood the square. What's happening now? Yeah, they're starting now. That's the custom dance. This is the custom dance. Yes. Paul says, just try to follow the men. Someone was telling strange metaphorical stories and dancing and singing in the United States Congress. I felt like it might be a little bit harder to lie if what they had to do was keep time with the rest of the village. A little bit harder to push us down the path of the oil industry if they had to be dancing, stomping, and singing the whole time. <laughs> It's a system that we all move together. Right. I say we, we are holding hands and moving as a team. Do people see that kind of relationship with the developed world in terms of climate? Well, that's the thing. It's like um, people take ownership. We're here. We're far away. We don't have any factories. But we're not blaming anyone for climate change. We're blaming ourselves. Maybe we're not playing our part right. All of these virtues, we have separate words for them. But they're not really separate things. Generosity, community, storytelling, dance, taking care of each other. But it does seem like, even though this is one of the poorest places on Earth, a place that we might consider, quote unquote, underdeveloped, that in the developed world, we were the ones who were underdeveloped. Underdeveloped in democracy, in generosity, and taking care of your fellow man underdeveloped in the link between metaphor, story, dance, and governance, underdeveloped in the ways that matter. In the developing world, there's a constant pressure to use fossil fuels to get out of poverty. But in this part of Zambia, they'd found another way.
We were driving through the night to one of the poorest districts in the country of Zambia in Africa. The Shangombo district has no electricity, no power plants, no power lines, no electric light, no computers. Schools had no light, hospitals had no light, homes had no light. But something was happening in this dark corner of Africa. Solar panels had begun to crop up all over the area. Suddenly people could have light in their homes, possibly basic refrigeration. Could the answer be as simple as the sun coming up every day? This is enough light for all the kids sitting from where that lady is and here where I am. So if you put one here, one there, one there, one there. Joe in Induna, or a tribal leader, a member of the royal family, was on a mission. He was driving all over the district in his vintage Land Rover to bring solar lights to schools so the students could study at night. It's the action. Yeah. It's the action that uh, I do. I do something the way I feel I should do it. We work with the community. We do what the community asks us to do. First, we are introducing it in schools. The next, it will be introduced in villages. You can't beat solar. It has come to stay. What if someone came and said, OK, we're going to drill a huge oil well or a big coal mine and take up a huge area here, and then we will give you electricity? No, that's not a good idea. They are forgetting that the next second, the person is dead. What happened to your grandchildren? Who doesn't know about that money? Like the way our grandparents left, we should also leave it for our grandchildren. That's why we're doing things which are permanently. Yes, because we look into the future of someone, not in a short-term period. Like the way when we give the solar lights, we want the kids for their education, which one of the kids will be one of the people who is going to be in a factory that makes the solar panel. So you want to see the solar panels being made here? Being made here. This will be an example for the whole world. He's doing your homework. Yeah. You guys are up late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're studying the effects of water pollution? Yeah. Is everybody studying about water pollution? <laughs> Sometimes you find the most astounding things written in the margin of a kid's notebook in junior high school. Right there, freedom is meaningless if there's poverty. The next thing that we will go for is food. That's what the people need. What are they going to eat? So if we change the same solar to give us water to irrigate, this district in Zambia can only farm two months out of the year during the rainy season. And the diet in this region is something called nishima, cornmeal, three meals a day. No fruit, no vegetables. Basic nutrition, which could help fend off all sorts of diseases and improve the health of the district, didn't exist. Yet the Zambezi River runs parallel to most of these towns to what Joe wants to build next, solar irrigation pumps as a women's empowerment project. The women of the Shangombo district would create small vegetable gardens and small community supported farms where they could sell their vegetables at the market. Joe's hope was that this would decrease the number of women forced into prostitution by poverty and that this in turn would decrease the staggering AIDS rate in the district. The storms of poverty, like the storms of the climate, the same path to shelter from both. A dream that development could actually benefit the climate and the people. There was just one place left I had to go. There was a story about a tree that I just couldn't get out of my mind.
When you're born, the first thing that comes out of, of the hospital room, it's the placenta. And they dig a ground and put it in there and they plant a coconut tree on top of it. And when that plant's growing, like it's like a pride to you, like that's my pute. It's your pute. That's my umbilical cord. And I guess growing up, we realized that that's actually our connection to the land. So your connection to the land is never lost. Some governments have no respect to that. Oh, and, and with the impact of climate change, it's threatening of us losing that. No. And that's exactly what's going on. And that's where I draw my energy from. Voila! I give you some more. <laughs> what? You're the Jack Black of climate change. <laughs>seem depressed. No, no, because the thing is that we, we feel more like warriors. We, we're not depressed because we can do something about it. You see? There's, there's a difference between, like, have no choice and having a choice. We have a choice. I came to meet you because I wanted to meet people who had no choice. <laughs> We have the biggest choice there is, is actually to fight and keep the things that, that we have. You can't just sit there and say, we're gonna drown, we're gonna drown, we're gonna drown. Right, because it makes you paralyzed in a way. Yeah, it, it, well, you're not doing yourself a favor. <laughs>
guys became close during Hurricane Sandy? Yes. And Sandy happened, and the boardwalk went through the school. The boardwalk went through the school? Yes, yes. Flooded it out, boardwalk was in the school. <laughs> and Raven was like, you should come to my school. And I was like, Sh I should. <laughs> Trying to help out, see what you can give to the people who have been affected. And my mom was saying, you know, well, our home is always open, no matter if you're a friend, you know, family, everybody is welcomed. And I just let her in. She was like a yes. little she was we like sister sisters. I never had. And they were all nice and welcoming for, to me. Um, it's amazing what's going on here. Do we have the resources we need still? No. Do we have to concern ourselves with that at certain points? Yes. But the amazing thing is we're stronger now than we were before the storm. We're stronger because internally we know we can face the music together and we can get the job done. We know that whatever hits us, we can rise above it. And not only rise above it as individuals, but rise above it collectively as a community. One of the tenets of what we do is to make the community feel safe, secure, and loved. And if you feel safe, secure, and loved, you dance. What else are you gonna do? If you're happy, you dance, you know? Climate change is about all of us. It is about the baby who is now eating lead paint because a hurricane came and washed away the other paint that was covering it, and his parents can't afford to move. It is about the grandmother who was looking forward to her retirement, but now gets up and cries every day because her job, her retirement, everything that she was looking for, her family is scattered to the wind. It is about people. And until people understand that it's not even just about people, but it's about you and it's about me, then we'll continue to have these disasters. It is about not giving up. Even though you have a hand pushing you down, you still are offering a hand to pull other people up. to do in this fight, well, it's like falling in love. You know it's going to turn your whole world upside down. And it won't be an easy ride. It'll be full of twists and turns. There'll be times when you feel like your heart is about to break and explode. But you have no choice. To turn away from it is a kind of death. Looking out the window, these atolls look like God's doodles on the surface of the ocean. And we could rise the tide and just erase them all. same boat. We say, I don't know how to save the world, yet I must save the world. I don't know how to save myself, yet I must save myself. I don't know where my soul resides, yet I must discover my soul because I live within it. This is the only planet, as far as we know, that has love songs. This is the only planet, as far as we know, that has poetry. And it's time to celebrate life and love. The world is saved and lost every day. Not all at once.
Raisings, the paper with lyrics that go up your paint. We're here to bring truth, celebrate life, tell stories of old, share knowledge, it's timeless. Yeah. Our cries are soundless, true power we found it. Surrender to love, with love be surrounded. Uh, this is our time, I find no moment so turn to the sky. Love with a heart, see through the disguise. Join hands, it's one people together will rise. Love, the things climate can't change. Dance in the sun and pray for the rain. This is our land, we stand to protect. The record that's playing, you'll never forget. Paint your rules of fire, burn in the sky. I can see those same stars that burn in your eyes. One person. Cause the seas to rise, the water to dry, I'll bring hope to someone's eyes. A movement is rising like the sea. The people will change the world. It's time to plant the seeds. It's time to plant the seeds. Hey. 